Uh, it's my uh, really great pleasure to introduce Robbie. Uh, Robbie is my PhD student and uh, my fifth PhD student. And uh, I just want to say a few things at the start about Robbie. Um, I think Robbie's one of the most well-known faces uh, at WeHi. Um, I met Robbie first, who, uh, who was introduced to me by Anna Quagliari, who's in the front row here, uh, who was a master's student in my lab, and she said, uh, I would like you to meet my friend Robbie, and you know, maybe he can do a project with you as well. And so that, that was the start of my relationship with Robbie. He came to me uh, in the same vein as Anna and did a master's uh, research project with me. And, and Robbie, like Anna, came from the University of Bologna from the biostatistics department there, which is uh, an outstanding statistics department. And both Anna and Robbie were outstanding students there, and he was a top student throughout his um, undergraduate career. Uh, in his uh, master's project with me, uh, he worked on a malaria project, uh, but it became clear to me that once uh, uh, we were kind of moving towards doing a PhD, I really felt that the MACTEL project, which he'll be uh, talking about, was really the project for him. And I felt that because of Robbie's very um, vivacious <coughs> style and his ability as a communicator would suit that project really well. And I was really disappointed when Robbie didn't buy my suggestions initially. <laughs> And I said, this great project for you, Robin. He's going, mm, no, I don't like it, don't think so. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, this is really hard as a supervisor. How much do you know? tell somebody this is really great for them? So I'm glad I persevered, because it took a couple of goes. And then we got Robbie sold on it. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, first of all, we had to get him a, a scholarship. And uh, Robbie is a holder of one of these prestigious international APAs, which you know are not very easy to get. So that was uh, the start of the PhD project. But I just wanted to uh, say something more broadly about uh, Robbie's role at the Institute. And you know from uh, his lovely T-shirt that he's wearing today, of which I have one too, uh, that he is a very, very strong uh, supporter and indeed member of the LGBTIQ plus community and uh, has contributed strongly to the WeHa community full stop in all sorts of manners. Uh, I just wanted to mention one other way he's contributed um, Robbie's fantastic audiovisual skills, or visualisation skills in particular, uh, led to his uh, very uh, strong contributions to the WeHi Athena Swan application, which was successful. So some of the graphs in there are from Robbie. Uh, he's also won awards for his contributions to the WeHi community, including two WeHi Arts Prizes. But let's go back to Robbie's uh, academic prowess. Um, I just wanted to highlight that last year Robbie won the Pittman Prize at the Australian, uh, New, Ze Australian and New Zealand Statistical Society, uh, which is the prize for the best oral presentation of a PhD student. That's a very prestigious award. In the same week, he then won back-to-back -back oral presentation prizes at the Gene Mappers Conference, um, uh, which is kind of the big uh, statistical genetics conference in Australia. Um, uh, so now turning to the project, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 we had, um, Robbie worked on this, uh, in his, for his PhD, on, on this rare retinal disorder, MACTEL, which he'll tell you more about. As a group, we've been working on this since 2011, so Robbie's been a continuation of this work. Robbie's work didn't really focus on methods developments the way uh, my previous PhD students have. Robbie's strengths really lie in terms of uh, deep statistical analysis, you know, really getting in deep in uh, very big data sets, um, uh, putting them together. So for his work, he looked at genomic, metabolomic, and transcriptomic data, and phenotypic data, uh, all on this uh, disorder. And he really developed a lot of inventive visu visualizations and very nice analysis. So the uh, output of this um, uh, uh, work really led to the continuation of our breakthrough paper in 2017 on this disorder, where we first described some genes for this disorder. And the main part of the talk he'll be telling you about today, or the main focus of that work, is the metabolomics analysis that came out of that work. And that's by no means all of the work that's happened uh, in that project. Uh, and during his PhD, he really gained a deep understanding of retina. You know, Robbie is a mini retina ophthalmologist by now, which is quite amazing for a bioinformatician. Uh, and he's learned a lot about the diagnostic modalities, uh, and he's been our go-to person in the lab when we have questions about that. Um, uh, so Robbie's work has contributed to several high-impact papers, including the original Nature Genetics paper, and uh, his work uh, contributed towards a paper that was accepted in New England Journal of Medicine last weekend. And his uh, first author paper is currently under review. What is also exciting is that this work has led to much broader uh, implications uh, 
we believe that uh, through this disorder and, and uh, through contributions by Robbie, that we have a very nice uh, connection between retinopathies and neuropathies, which our collaborators and us are, are very excited about uh, and in pursuing further. And this disease has really uh, teased that apart a bit further, and you'll see that as we get towards the end of this talk. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Robbie, welcome to the stage, and I know it's going to be a very exciting, funky <laughs> seminar. <laughs> Right, you go. <laughs> well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my Wednesday seminar. I'm quite excited. Uh, and I'm also very excited because I'm wearing this microphone. It makes me feel a lot look like Britney Spears on a stage. <laughs> so it's going to be fun. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to tell you um, some of my results from my thesis entitled Integrating Gomics Data to Dissect the Causes of Macular Telangiectasia Type 2. Now let's see where this thing works. Yes. So macular telangiectasia, or MACTEL in short, because I cannot say macular telangiectasia 300,000 times in a presentation, so MACTEL, uh, is a eye disease, and specifically it's a disease that affects the retina. Now, as most of you already know, possibly, the retina is the back of our eye, and it's super important because it contains this kind of cells called photoreceptors. These are the cells that react to light, send an image, send a signal to the brain, and allow us to see. Now, MACTEL affects a very particular area of the retina, which is called the macula, which I'm highlighting in here. The macula, as human, we have a macula. Mice, unfortunately, don't have a macula, just to say. Um, and why is this area so important? That's because in humans it contains most of the photoreceptors that are present in our eye. Uh, now, just to give you a feeling on how it is to live uh, with MACTEL, I'm just going to ask all the people in the audience who have glasses, can you please take your glasses? Go for it. Now, put them on the tip of your nose. Now, tilt them. OK, stare at this image. For everybody else who doesn't have glasses, just look around and check how everybody else looks like. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. One of the first symptoms that MACTEL uh, patients report is that they have this. This, of course, is an exaggeration of it, but this is called metamorphosis, and this is a distortion of the image. One of the other symptoms that they report is this one, which is called a scotoma. Now, this is a vision loss in the central vision of MACTEL patients. Now, you can imagine that if you start looking at something and you try to focus on something and you have a very dark black shadow in front of it, it gets annoying. And not only annoying, it gets quite scary because you are realizing you're getting blind. Now, also, the disease is not a stable disease. It progresses, although slowly. And the problem is that patients realize that it progresses. And the more it progresses, the more your vision is going to start looking more like this. So as you can imagine, this is quite um, Confronting as a disease, like it impacts a lot on patients' life, mental state, and general like, ability of living. And also, the other problem with MACTEL is that MACTEL has absolutely no cure. And that's because no one knew what was causing the disease. Spoiler alert, until now. <laughs> <laughs> so, MACTEL has, uh, in terms of retinal phenotypes, it has a lot of things, there are a lot of things going on in the retina of MACTEL patients. Now, I don't have time to go through all of this one because it will just take too long, but just for you to know, like we have a lot of layers in the retina that basically start degenerating. We have a big problem with vessels that start growing weird, they take weird shift, they get um, blunted, they start leaking. We have other problem uh, of pigment, crystals and stuff, so a lot of different things that cause the disease. OK, so MACTEL is a medium um, rare disease. It has a prevalence that has been estimated to be between 0.1% and 0.0045%. Um, it has an average age of diagnosis between 60 years old. Um, no differences have been seen between males and females, though a very interesting comorbidity of MACTEL is type 2 diabetes. So it has been observed that a lot of MACTEL patients actually present type 2 diabetes. Now, in the talk today, I don't have time to go deep into this connection. I have some cool um, connections between the two of them. So like, if you are interested, please ask me at the end. Um, also, uh, it has been observed that MACTEL also have high, like MACTEL patients also present high BMI, high hypertension, and they are usually smokers. Um, one of the most striking features of MACTEL is that it has been observed to be a familial disease. What does this mean? Is that if we observe a patient with MACTEL and then we check in their families, chances are that we're going to find other uh, family members also affected by the disease. Now, what does this mean 
is that maybe there is something in genetics going on. And since this is a rare disease and runs through family, the first thing that our collaborator thought about was, well, what if there are some rare variants that run through this family, were being like inherited and passes through, who actually cause the disease? So maybe there is very, very, one very particular rare variant that completely causes the disease. So they tried to do these family studies. Unfortunately, they found absolutely nothing. Uh, so the next question they asked was, OK, what about common variants? What about if we start to check variants that are not maybe fully causal and they are a little bit more common? Let's see what, where we can go there. OK, so for my entire talk today, I'm going to refer as common variants or genetic variants. What I mean are SNPs. Now, what a SNP is, uh, and I'm going to refer as a SNP always as, so a SNP has two allele in the general po population. One is the more common allele, which is the reference allele. Take, for example, might be 80% in the population, and the alternative allele, so the rarer allele, is going to be 20. So when I'm going to refer to a SNP, I'm always going to refer to the alternative allele of a SNP. Now, when we look whether a SNP is associated with a disease, what we look for is something like this. So say, for example, again, if a SNP has 20% uh, prevalence in the population, maybe in the disease population is going to have 40%. Now, as you can clearly see from this table, this does not mean that that SNP alone will cause the disease, because otherwise these people won't be healthy at all. Um, but it might be associated with the disease. And how do we do this? We don't look for one SNP, we look for many SNP. Because if we see that a lot of different SNP in the genome they all might point us in the same direction and maybe point us to a common biological mechanism that they all together affect. Maybe they will have a little effect, but when you sum up all of this big effect, maybe they can actually start messing up um, with the physiology of the patients. Okay, so this brings me to my four studies. Today I'm going to present you with four different studies. So two of the studies that I'm going to present you are my very, very own studies that I've done. <laughs> And the other two are studies that I have collaborated with, <laughs> um, with our collaborators, so like, just for you to know. Okay, so the very first study was, okay, let's identify, as Melanie said, this was our study published in 2017. Let's identify which SNP affect the disease. Okay, so in this study, we collected both genetics and metabolomics data. I'm going to explain in a second why also metabolomics data. And as I said, yes, this paper has been published. Um, so we collected. SNP data, specifically we collected 6 million SNPs on all of these subjects. So on more than 700 MACTEL cases, so um, MACTEL patients, and more than 1,700 healthy patients, so controls. Okay, this is the result of this analysis. This analysis is called AGWAS, which stands for Genome-Wide Association Analysis. And what we do in this analysis is that we take all of the 6 million SNPs and we test whether each one of them is associated with the disease. This is called a Manhattan plot, and each dot here is one SNP. The taller the dot, the higher the dot, the more significant the SNP is and the more associated it is with the disease. And we are looking for these things uh, which are towers, hence why a Manhattan plot. And our tallest tower were this, was this one. It was topped by a SNP in chromosome 5. And this was a SNP in the middle of those genes that you might recognize. But especially that gene, it was quite cool for us because it was previously being identified to be associated with retinal vascular caliber and retinal thickness. Now, you remember at the beginning I was telling you the MACTEL sort of like some of the tissue starts going down, they collapse, so the retinal thickness and the vessels problem. Uh, uh, quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, the, even more interesting, we found other four towers. Two of these fully significant, other two of these a little bit less significant as indicated by this line, but still quite important. And these four towers, they were all topped by SNPs, which were seen by previous studies to be associated with the glycine and serine pathway, and specifically the abundance of glycine and serine in uh, the metabolism of patients. Now, for today's talk, I'm completely going to ignore all of the vasculature problem and that signal in chromosome 5. That's a completely different story. Today, my talk is really going to be focused on the glycine and serine pathway and especially the effect that these two metabolites might have on the disease. Okay, so the first question we asked was, okay, the GWAS is pointing us to a direction that maybe says, checking the metabolism of MACTEL, and specific, of MACTEL patients and specifically check whether there is something going on in, with glycine and serine. So we collected metabolomics data on 50 cases and 50 controls. 
Just to note, these 50 cases and 50 controls are completely independent from the patients that we use in the genetic data. So these are completely different people. And we collected 856 metabolites, and we tested them all, and we checked, okay, where are glycine and serine, what are they doing? So we analyzed all of them. And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> what we found was that the three most significant metabolites now, here in this row you have all of these dots are all metabolite, the, again, the higher the dot, the most significant, the three most significant metabolites were indeed glycine, serine, and threonine. Now, threonine is another amino acid, and we weren't too surprised that also threonine was so significant, and that's because if you check on CAG, threonine is super close to both glycine and serine. In fact, all the three of them belong to the same pathway, which is called the glycine, serine, and threonine metabolic pathway. So it wasn't a big surprise to see that. Though, if the genetic data told us that um, glycine and serine were, were important, and the metabolomics data confirmed that they were important, another amazing thing that the metabolomics told us is how they were important. What we observed in the metabolomics data was that all the three of them, glycine, serine, and threonine, were extremely depleted in MACTEL patients. Now, another thing to note here that I forgot to say is that all of this data comes from blood of MACTEL patients. And that's because, of course, not that we can you know, take off like one of the eyes of MACTEL patients. Like, I don't think they will be very happy about it. Uh, so this is all blood. Okay, so to summarize the first study, what we noticed is that there are um, certain uh, SNPs this chromosome, which possibly affect this particular pathway, and we found three metabolites that are extremely associated with the disease. Now, at this stage, the most common question that possibly pops in mind is, great, so do these metabolites actually cause the disease? Great question, very hard to answer, but hey, we have a trick. That trick is called STARTS. <laughs> <laughs> this brings me to my second study, um, in which, so before I talked about both gen genetics and metabolomics, in this study I only collected genetics, although I'm gonna talk about a lot about metabolites, just bear in mind, there are no, meta no metabolic measurements, measured here is only genetics. Okay, so in this study we use this technique called Mendelian randomization. This is a statistical technique that has been used to uh, claim causality. Now, I'm gonna try to explain how it works, um, I just need to ask you generally, this is a very well-known uh, methodology, it's not a Robbie method, it works. And I'm gonna to try to explain you how, but yeah, just trust me, it's not like a super new method. Um, okay, so Mendelian randomization tries to um, establish causality by using genetic variants as instrumental variables. And how does it do that? Imagine for a second, it exists causation, okay? So serine is causing the disease, okay? If you found does it work? Yes. If we found a genetic variance which affects the metabolic level of serine, and serine is causing the, the disease, what we expect to see is that the genetic variance will also be associated with the disease. Now, for a second, imagine there is what we call reverse causation. So something is causing the, the disease, okay, and serine gets depleted only as a consequence. Now again, if we found the genetic variants which affect the metabolic level of serine, and this genetic variance has nothing to do with this, we do not expect to see an association. Same thing goes for what we call confounding. Remember at the beginning, I told you that um, there is a very, very high prevalence of diabetes in MACTEL patients. If diabetes causes both of them, so it causes MACTEL for one reason, and also causes a depletion of serine, we found genetic variants which are associated with serine, this should not, we should not observe any association here. Now, a lot of you already like, might already think of, yeah, but what if the genetic variance is actually causing diabetes itself, then of course like, you're, gonna, you're gonna see this. And that's a very, very good observation, but what we do is that we use multiple genetic variants to do this. So we never base our results on only one genetic variance, we look in the entire genome and we try to find all of the genetic variants which are affecting a specific metabolite, say for example serine, and then we check whether all of them are associated with the disease, because say serine is not causing this, and one of these variants has that problem that I just told you about, the association that, that we're gonna see is gonna be masked by the known association of all the other ones. So we need to consider really all of them and whether all of them associates with the disease. How do we do that? The first thing that we need to find is to identify the genetic variants which affect metabolic levels. And to do that, we enter in collaboration with the University of Cambridge, 
and they have performed what is called a GWAS meta-analysis on 142 metabolites. You remember the Manhattan plot, the one with the towers that I showed you before? Well, they've done 142 of them, each for one of the metabolites, in which they were checking in all the genome, which are, which are the SNP, which affect the metabolic abundance of all of these metabolites. And of course, they've done it on 85,000 people because, you know, University of Cambridge, yeah, yeah, they do things big, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Uh, this is an extract of their results here. I'm only showing you the tallest towers and the, most, the significant ones. And here again, you see all of the SNP and their position in the chromosome. The taller the tower, the more significant. And in this axis, you see all of the different metabolites. Now, here the colors simply represent different classes of metabolites and their families. Now, these results not only tell us which are the SNPs, which are important for the metabolites, but it also tells us how much. So to each of these SNPs, we can associate an effect that the SNP has on the metabolite. Because say, for example, one SNP might increase the metabolomics level of one metabolite, when instead another SNP might decrease it, right? So we need to put them all together. And how do we do that? We take that information, which, by the way, those, again, those 85,000 people are completely independent from our own study, and we go back to our own genetic data. And what we do is that we take the SNP that they tell us is important to predict one metabolite, and what we can try to do is that we can genetically predict the metabolic level of one metabolite. And how do we do that? We take all the three SNPs, we multiply them by their effect, maybe like this increase, this decrease, this increase as well, and then we sum them up, and for each subject we can genetically predict the level of, of a specific metabolite. Now, you can see this as, imagine like this is serine, this is the, the metabolic scale of serine, for each subject we're going to have an estimate. Now, and of course, this estimate is going to be dependent on the combination of SNPs that each of these subjects has. So if you start imagining that we see something like this, in which all of the cases are very, very low, are very, very low in this case, and all of the controls are very, very high, start telling us something. Now, of course, during their lifetime, these patients will present all sorts of different levels of serine, because, you know, serine depends on, I don't know, the time of the day, what you eat, how beautiful you are. No. <laughs> <laughs> but this at least gizma gives us an estimate that will never change during their lifetime. And that's because nothing can change entirely your DNA, or generally. Um, so with this method, basically, we can genetically predict the level of one metabolite for, for all, actually all of the levels of all of these metabolites for all people, and then we can test whether these levels actually are causally associated with the disease. So we test for causality of all of these 142 metabolites, you excited? <laughs> and <laughs> what we saw was that, again, the two most significant metabolites among all of this one were, again, serine and glycine. So quite interesting. Look what happened to Trioni. That cheeky little bastard. This one went down here. And that's because threonin is possibly associated. Uh, it w we saw threonin to be extremely depleted in MACTEL patients, not because threonin was causal for the disease, but only because your level of threonin possibly depends on your level of glycine and serine. So threonin was only a consequence of the depletion of glycine and serine, which instead they are likely to cause the disease. Um, another thing that we found is that we found other metabolites which were causally associated with glycine and serine, though some of these metabolites shared with glycine and serine some of these SNP that we used to predict them. So what we asked was, okay, if we take into account the effect that glycine and serine have of the disease, are all of these metabolites still going to be significant? The answer was no, apart from one, alanine. Now, alanine is another amino acid, though it has not much to do with glycine and serine in terms of that pathway that I showed you before. They're not really connected on that pathway. And especially, if you see, the effect of these two metabolites is negative on the disease, so it means depletion causes disease, when instead for alanine, the opposite was true. An abundance of alanine was causing the, the disease. At that stage, we had no idea what this result meant. And it was like, OK, alanine is causing the disease somehow. We don't know how, but just remember alanine. Um, another amazing thing that this analysis told us is that you remember at the beginning, when we measured blood, uh, we actually saw that both glycine and serine were depleted in MACTEL patients. Well, genetically predicted glycine and serine were also estimated to be depleted. So only by looking at the genetics of these people, we could already predict that only because of their DNA, these people should have less glycine and serine. And that's, in fact, what we observed before. So that was quite cool. Another thing that they asked uh, in the same study was, OK, we found that uh, glycine and serine 
and maybe alanine are causing the, the, the disease. What about the phenotypes? If I completely discard all of the controls and I only start looking at cases, do I see any differences in cases that may have high genetically predicted glycine and serine or low? So to do this, I received five years worth of data from my collaborators on 455 cases. And on each of these, I had more than 120 eye abnormalities. Now, I don't have time to go on the methodology that I've used here. If you're interested on, on this, ask me maybe, maybe later. But long story short, what I found was that genetically predicted serine and only genetically predicted serine was truly associated in case only to disease progression. And especially what I've observed is that a depletion of serine should make the disease progress faster. Start making sense, doesn't it? Um, so to summarize, if in the first study, this is what we found, with the second study, we were actually able to truly understand that these genetic variants were mostly affecting possibly glycine and serine. Threonine was only a bystander of this depletion. Alanine was possibly another causal uh, metabolite. And here I'm not drawing a line between glycine and serine, because I didn't have time to tell you, but I did another analysis in which pr basically we managed to, un to understand that the causal effect of glycine only depended on the fact that glycine and serine can be converted into one another. So we, we were having already like some uh, indication that serine might not be that causative alone. Um, OK, at this stage I ask, what else? If you, like, as you know, our metabolism is very dynamic, right? If, if you start messing up with some of the metabolites and these metabolites get depleted, something else might come up or something else starts getting, you know, um, um, yeah, a little bit wrong in the metabolism. So this brings me to my four, third studies. As in study two, I only use genetics. Here I'm only going to use instead metabolomics data, again from blood. And this is an expanded metabolomics study that is expanded from the first study, the, the metabolites that I've already collected. So this was in collaboration with the Frutiger lab at UCL and the Eagle lab at the Morfield Sci Hospital in London. Uh, so in this one, we collected 60 cases and 58 controls. We, we expanded a little bit the study. We cleaned better the metabolites. We apply like uh, more statistical techniques to clean them better. And we tested again whether all of these 738 metabolites were significant to the disease, and we tried to understand also all of the other one and trying to understand what was going on in the metabolism of MACTEL patients as a global thing. OK, this is a summary of the results. It's quite a dense plot. Uh, now, all of the entry here, all of the rows, is one metabolite. Each metabolite has one of these lines that you see here. If one line is on the right, yes. If it's on the right, means the metabolite is um, over, um, overabundant in MACTEL patient. If it is on the, less, on the left, it means is depleted. Now, all of the metabolites are divided in color, which are subfamilies, and the big colors here are the big families of the metabolites. Now, of course, the most significant one that we found was glycine and serine. Fine, got it. Um, though today, among all of these one, one in particular one that I want to show you is this one, which was 2-hydroxyglutarate. 2-hydroxyglutarate in this study came up as the third most significant metabolite. Now, 2-hydroxyglutarate, as you see here, is a fatty acid. It's so not an amino acid. Again, it has nothing to do with glycine and serine in terms of glycine and serine and threonine metabolic pathway. But it was quite cool because, do you remember the SNPs that I, told, that I showed you at the beginning in those towers? These SNPs were seen to affect the expression and they were actually located on these three genes, CPS1, PSPH, and PHGDH. If you look at CAG, these genes are important for the uh, production of both glycine and serine. Now, still, if you look at CAG, what you notice is that PHGDH is important for the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate. So this result was basically telling us if you start messing up with this NIP, which in turn will affect these genes, then chances are that you're going to affect everything that is related to these genes. And this result was quite cool because the metabolomics result was almost back confirming again something that was going on at a genetic level. And again, what we saw is that as glycine and serine, also 2-hydroxyglutarate was extremely depleted in MACTED patients which kind of fits with the fact that we are starting to mess up with the gene that is used to produce it. Um, another thing that you can notice from this plot is that there are a lot of metabolites that are significant, and they belong to the same subfamily. So what we asked in this case was, OK, is there any subfamily in which all of the metabolites of this subfamily are uh, important for MACTEL? So is the entire subfamily, instead of only few metabolites, that is important for MACTEL? To answer that, what we did was um, an enrichment pathway analysis which um, that answered that question. And 
This is the a visualization of that result. This is what we call our brick wall, in which every entry here, instead of being a metabolite, is a subfamily of metabolites. Again, here you have the big families of the metabolites. And each brick inside this visualization is one metabolite. And the color of the brick is, is the metabolite up or is the metabolite down? Mactan. Again, most significant one, glycine and trionine, yeah, got it. But we found out that uh, subfamilies of metabolites were all together, they were completely shifted. And the second and third most significant one were these two, the phosphatidylethanolamine subpathway and the lisophosphatidylethanolamine pathway. So, and this was um, a risk factor like in the lipids metabolism that no one has ever observed before, but we didn't really know what was going on here again. Another thing that we checked was, as you know, um, the metabolism, again, is quite dynamic. So um, metabolite level react to perturbation on other metabolites levels, right? So there are a lot of correlations going on in the metabolism. So we ask, are these correlations among all of these metabolites different between controls and MACTER patients? So these are two circus plots in which each entry is one subfamily. Each line is a connection from one metabolite of that family and another metabolite of another family. The thicker the line, the more connections there are, and the color of the line is simply positive or negative. Now, as you can see, these two mostly look the same, but when you look at this subfamily called the sphingomyelin, you can observe that in controls, sphingomyelin has a lot of connection. If you look at cases, this connection starts almost like disappearing. We found other subfamilies that had um, certain features similar to this one, but sphingomyelin was extremely interesting because it was the only subfamily which in control connected the two most significant subfamilies, so the glycine, serine, and trionine metabolic pathway with the phosphatylate ethanolamine pathway. And you, you can see here these connections were quite strong in controls. When you start looking at cases, these connections tend to disappear. Now, this was quite interesting because it almost told us that sphingomyelin almost had this central law role on kind of almost modulating these two families, and it had a central role on modulating them in controls, but this modulation role was almost lost in MACTEL patients, which was another new thing that we could observe. Now, we gave all of the results to our uh, biochemistry collaborators in London, and they were able to build up like this gigantic map on how everything, all of our results and all of the metabolites and pathway connect to each other. If you have any question about this, don't ask. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Have a try. <laughs> like, I might be able to explain some of this. <laughs> um, okay, so if in the second study we were left like this, in the third study we managed to, un to understand there were other metabolites that were involved with MACTEL, and especially this phosphatylethanolamine group and this sphingomyelin group was modulating these two groups which were clearly associated with MACTEL. Now, this brings me to my very last study in which this is another metabolomic state, um, study. Though instead of collecting all of those metabolites as we did before, we only collected few metabolites that we were interested on. And this is actually like a bigger study compared to, to before. If before we only had um, 100 patients in total, here we had almost 200. Um, and this is a study that is the one that Melanie was mentioning before. It has been recently accepted at the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was a collaboration with the Lowy Medical Research Institute and the Friedlander Lab and University of California, San Diego with the Metallo Lab. Now, uh, the uh, paper has been accepted, but it's not out yet. So we have been asked, just maybe don't take pictures. <laughs> okay, so there is this uh, enzyme called SPT. Now, what SPT does is that it takes palmitol-CoA and serine, it ligates them together, and create these other metabolites, which is called sphingani. Now, imagine the serine is not there because it's way too low. What SPT is gonna do is that instead of taking serine, that is just not there, it's gonna take alanine and ligate it with palmitol-CoA. This is gonna create these other metabolites called deoxysphinganine. Now, deoxysphinganine has already been um, observed in other study to be really, really toxic for cells and especially for neuronal cells. Now, interestingly, there is this very, very rare mutation in this gene called SPTLC1. Uh, and this mutation, if you have this mutation, what this mutation does is that it changes your SPT. And even if you have enough serine, your SPT is gonna take anyway alanine. So it's gonna gain an affinity to ligate palmitol-CoA with alanine. And it's gonna result on high deoxysphingolipids. 
Now, this, uh, this mutation is a mutation that is already known to cause this super rare disease called hereditary sensory neuropathy type 1. This is um, a peripheral neuropathy. People start losing the sensitivity in their fingers and in their feet. Um, so what our question was, great, so if this one is actually the causal pathway, so if a depletion of serine causes the oxysphingolipids, and this patient should have deox high deoxysphingolipids, not because of low serine, maybe this patient also have MACTAD. Now also, this idea came out because, as I told you at the beginning, MACTAD is a late onset disease, right? So the first symptoms around 60 years of age. One of our collaborators in Utah observed, um, received a MACTAD patient, a very severe MACTAD patient, who was 21. So super young, with very, very severe symptoms of MACTAD already. This patient told our collaborator that he had HN1, he had this disease. And he also said that his father had HN1, and also his father was starting having a problem with his vision. HN1 is a super rare disease, so what we said was, okay, let's try to collect as many HN1 patients, and let's try to check whether this patient actually has MACTEL as well, because like this uh, comorbidity has never been reported before. So let's see whether we can see MACTEL in HN1. So we found 13 on this patient, 11 out of them had MACTEL. Now, you can imagine what is the chances of finding a rare disease like MACTEL in an even rarer disease like HN1. I don't need to tell you the, the p-value that is associated with this because it will have like 100,000 zeros in front of it. Uh, so this was the very first clue that we had of a one causal variant super rare that might be completely causing the, the, the disease, and it was pointing us to the direction that actually this was the causal pathway and it was because of the oxy. Now, the other question was, okay, what about MACTEL patients who don't have HM1? They don't have this mutation, so do they have high deoxysphingolipids? Deoxysphingolipids is not a thing that you usually measure in a targeted metabolomic study like we did before, because it's a very specific type of, sphing of, of sphingolipids, not something that people usually are interested in. So we went there and checked, and guess what? Um, we found that MACTEL patients that don't have HN1 have extremely high level of deoxysphingolipids. Again, confirming the hypothesis that low serine causes, because of that pathway, high deoxysphingolipids, which are toxic. You remember alanin? At the beginning, I told you that the other metabolite that we found that was possibly causal was alanin, and it was causal because of high alanin. Uh -huh. Hey, here we go. What we think is that um, MACTEL patients who might be normal level of serine or might even have like a low depletion of serine, so not completely deficient in serine, but have way too high alanine. If you have these this, this proportions in ratio between your level of serine and your level of alanine, maybe what's going to happen is that SPT is still going to take alanine just because alanine is just there. It's just super available when instead maybe serine is a little bit down. So that's what we think that result on alanine means, and it actually fits with the story. You remember also sphingomyelin, that pathway that I was telling you was modulating our two most significant metabolites in controls, and this modulation was completely lost in MACTEL patients. You might have noticed that the deoxy level overlap. So the deoxy level of MACTEL patients, there are some MACTEL patients who have low deoxy, which they kind of shouldn't, right? If deoxy is fully causal and completely causal, why do they have MACTEL? Well, I tried to compare what were the metabolites that divided these MACTEL patients from the controls, and this turned out to be sphingomyelin. An extreme depletion of sphingomyelin is what truly divides MACTEL patients from controls in a low deoxy environment. So that was quite cool that among all of the metabolites that we could test, again, sphingomyelin was coming up as the, that family of metabolites who could divide and explain this part of the disease. Um, a lot of you already like, are thinking like, yeah, Robbie, but all of these results, you've always measured them in blood of MACTEL patients. We have no idea what's happening in the retina, depletion of serine, does it cause it deoxysphingolipids in the retina, what's going on? Again, as I said, we can't take off eyes of MACTEL patients, but we can do mice. So what our collaborators did is that they put um, between 10 and 18, depending on the, on the study, um, two sets of mice, one on a normal diet, and the other one on a diet that was completely free of glycine and serine. And we check whether the, di the diet mice 
In the diet mice, we saw the serine was constantly depleted because of the um, um, diet that they were taking, so that's fine. What we just saw is that these mice were developing really high deoxy in both plasma, and guess what? They were developing high deoxy in retina, generally, and especially on this other tissue called RPE, which is a tissue which is super important for MACTEL because of things. Um, so by depleting your level of glycine and serine in your blood, chances are that you are going to create a very high level of deoxysphingolipids even in your retina. Now, not only these mice presented these ones, like this very, very high level of deoxysphingolipids, but if you wait long enough, guess what? These mice start getting blind and they start losing their vision. So we put them on a photopic B-way and a photopic flicker, basically things that the mice can see. And we could see that the mice could see much less. The mice on, a, on the diet could see much less respect to the control mice. And I think that we noticed was these mice when we put them on a hot plate. Now, a hot plate here only means that the, the plate is just warm and is uncomfortable for, for the mice, but not burning them alive. Uh, we saw that the mice started developing a sensory neuropathy. They could not, they were taking way too much time to actually feel that the place was getting hot. So depletion of serine causes high deoxy in both blood, retina, and also on the nerve, static nerve, and so related to their neuropathy. So that was quite of a confirmation of actually this causal pathway. Okay, so just to recap, all of my studies, so with the first study, we managed to understand there were some genetic that was related to this particular pathway, and these three metabolites were associated with the disease. With the second pathway, we managed to understand the threonine, only a bystander, serine, possibly causal, alanine, quite causal as well, and glycine, maybe only causal because of its relationship with serine. With the first study, we managed to find more metabolite associated, and we identify also this phosphatidylethanolamine and this fingomanin group. And it was truly with our last study, we were truly able to really claim a full causal pathway that was going literally from the basic genetic all the way up to the metabolite until the disease. We could actually claim that this deoxys fingolipid could actually be one of the main causes of MACTEL. And that is quite amazing because now we have a druggable um, metabolite that we can target. Now, we actually try to drug these metabolites. I don't think I have time. So, yeah, I will. If you want to ask me about cell studies that we've done with organoids cells, I have some results about that. Um, and one thing that I really uh, want to stress out is that there is much more. This was a very, very lucky PhD, and we managed to find um, maybe like a, one of the causal pathways of the disease, but this is not enough, and it's not completely solved. So I showed you before, the oxysphingolipids are not, um, do not divide completely MACTEL cases from control, so there is still some overlap, so we don't know what's going on in there. There is, again, a relationship of MACTEL with diabetes that we have not explained yet, although we have observed some similarities. There is much more metabolic disturbances going on in the metabolism. And also what we are doing recently is that we have doubled the sample size of our first, of our first genetic study. And we are doing what is called a GWAS 2.0. Uh, and we are discovering much more signal in the genome. And so some of these new towers seem to have nothing to do again with glycine and serine. So maybe like we're discovering also the other peripheral pathways and the other peripheral causal mechanism that might affect the disease because of other pathways. Uh, cool. So with that one, I need to start my acknowledgement that the biggest one goes to the MACTEL patients and their families. These patients have donated a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of samples. Um, but especially, yeah, all of their time, all of their willingness to help all of us research and their family to support them. So the biggest thank you, of course, goes to them. Um, I had a blast of a PhD, so I really have to thank a lot of people here. <laughs> okay. Of course, uh, starting with the Ballo Lab and, of course, starting with Ilua, Melanie. <laughs> Melanie, like, what can I say? Like, I had, I had an absolute blast of a PhD. This has been incredible. Thank you so much for convincing me to take this project. 
Um, yeah, like literally, like what can I say? Melanie, you might have noticed sometimes my come across is a little bit quirky, but she's, she's absolutely lovely. Uh, like literally, I could not have asked for a better supervisor. She's always been super encouraging, super supportive. Also, like all of those times that I went to her and was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and just got up and she was like, no, don't worry. It's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Uh, and just thank you so much for all the possibilities and the opportunities that you have given me. This entire research is um, directed by a consortium that fly us like, to both San Diego and New York, and every lab presents. Most of the time are the lab heads who present the results. Melanie was one of the few lab members who said, Robbie, this is your work. Do you want to present it? So like, a very, very big thank you, seriously, for everything you've done to me. Um, other lab members from the Valor Lab, of course, a gigantic thank you. Saskia, which is with us today, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Saskia has been basically my second mentor and supervisor since I stepped foot of WeHa, and now has become one of my best friends. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your support, your friendship, everything you've done to me. It's been incredible. Um, also, thank you so much to Brandon. Where are you? I lost it. There. <laughs> yeah, also, Brandon has been basically the postdoc that as Saskia left, Brandon stepped in and I did this. I need, I need a new postdoc, and Brenda was there. Thank you so much for all the support, your enthusiasm, and the fact that you're working with me. I really look forward to working with you again in the future. And of course, all of the other members, past and present, of the Battle Lab that have helped me out. All of the members of the Population Health and Immunity Division, which have supported me. The biggest thank you goes to Natalie. <laughs> Natalie was the person that literally like, prevented my PhD to crumble into pieces, me getting lost in Europe or in the States or something like that, and kept me like, you know, together, and all of my ducks kind of together. Thank you so much, man, Natalie, for everything you've done. Uh, thank you so much to Kat and Sam like, to help me out, like, build up this presentation, taking pictures and stuff. Thank you for all of your support. All of the other lab mem um, members from the Population Health and Immunity, all of my collaborators from the Bioinformatics Division. First, Anna. Anna, uh, I've known Anna for basically 10 years now. Me and Anna have done together our uh, undergrad. We've done part of our master together. We have done our PhD together, and we have lived together for half of all of this time. <laughs> I to Anna, what can I say? Like, I think, yeah, you have become, I think, more a sister now than a simple friend or colleague, and you have changed me in the better in so many different ways. So thank you so much, literally, for everything. Um, thank you so much for... Alex and Gordon, that also like the two of them, every time I was like, I don't know how to do this. They were like, don't worry, we'll solve it. No worries, it's fine. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and also thanks so much to all of the other members of the Bioinformatics Division, my PhD committee, Terry, Matt, Oliver, and Tracy. Thank you so much for all of your support, all of your excitement about my research. Thank you to all of our Morphids Eye Hospital collaborators, Ferenc, Thiebo, and Kati, our UCL collaborators, Marcus and Sasha, our LMRI collaborators, uh, Mari, Leah, Martin, at the lab. Our Melbourne University collaborators that are actually based here in Melbourne, uh, Mali and Robin. Our big collaborators from the University of Columbia who literally gave us all of the genetic data, and as you see, it was quite a lot. So like, he did quite of an enormous job uh, from the Columbia University Rando. All of our collaborators from the MACTEL consortium. As I told you before, like, the entire research on MACTEL disease is um, coordinated and supported by this group of people who are literally luminaries, and they are amazing, extremely supporting. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with all of them. It's something that I really look forward to doing in the future. Um, a big thank you to all of the WeHi professional services who have helped me out not only for my PhD, but everything else that I've been doing here. And if it wasn't for them, this would not have been possible at all. Gigantic thank you to Louise Johansson, Louise Norton, Ellen Conti, Cameron Wells, Lucy McPhee, Aroni Wilson, and Rosie and also all of the other one from the professional services, like the entire graphic, IT, comms, events department, everybody, I surely forgot someone, so forgive me. Um, a big thank you to all of my WeHi friends. Uh, you are way too many, I uh, could not fit you all in here, but yes, a gigantic thank you, I had a blast of a PhD because of you. Uh, all of my WeHi friends and all of my uh, WISA um, friends and colleagues, it's been very cool. Um, thank you so much to Doug and Sam. Uh, not only like because of my PhD, but literally like every single thing that I've done, apart from my PhD, that by the way Melanie has allowed me to do, it was always super supported by both Doug and Sam. I was like, oh, do you think we could do this? They were like, yeah, go for it, have a try, yeah. So thank you so much for supporting, yeah, me to do these kind of things and also to, to create this environment who has been 
was let me uh, feel welcome, supported, and happy to be who I was in my workplace. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to Medu and Figen, who have basically prevented me from starvation from half of my PhD. <laughs> and for basically becoming my second two moms here at WeHi. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and to all of you guys, all of WeHi, again, this PhD has been amazing. I couldn't have thought about a better place where to do a PhD. Um, thank you so much to all of my housemates. Oh my God, like these people that have lived with me, especially Stina and Gina, who well, now have lived with me for basically like five years. The poor thing now, like they're like, oh, can you just go away? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and all of the other ones who will live with me, a big patient they have. Uh, all of my queer in science colleagues, and especially Sarah Stevenson, who helped me out building this association, who I didn't even thought it was possible to build. My Italian family, my parents, Maura and Enza, and my brother, Simone. All of my Italian friends who have supported me, all of them, from basically like the other side of the globe, so a big job from them. And last but not least, my partner Mark, who's here today, thank you so much. He had to deal with me in the last few months and prevented me from going completely insane. Uh, last again and not least, all of, my, um, all of the uh, fundings that I received, so all of the funding bodies from the Lowy family, Edith Moffat, John and Patricia Farron Foundation, LMRI, Melbourne Uni, and especially WeHi. And with that, thank you so much for coming, and I'm ready to take some questions. All right, um, just a word of warning, this is the second time it's being used. I have to throw these to people and then you are supposed to throw them on. So let's see how we go. Uh, I'm going to attempt a slightly longer throw. Dave had his hands up first. Yay! Can you, hey, can you supplement the serine in the diet? <laughs> I said that Directly in the one. eye. So um, there has been some discussion about it. Now in terms of... Um, the clinical um, availability of actually injecting serine directly in the eye or maybe like with eye drops or something like that. There has been some, some discussion. I don't know the technicality of it, but something that we can surely do is that we can try to supplement serine by oral supplementation. Serine, a, serine and glycine are available at the counter. Yeah. So what is going on right now as the main idea in the market consortium for maybe future clinical trials is maybe to use this drug who can remove first the deoxy from their metabolism and degrade in them, and then supplement the patients with serine and glycine who are available at the counter in any uh, pharmacy, and maybe we can prevent them from developing deoxysphingolipids again. Very good question, by the way. <laughs> The HSN1 patients are getting treated with high levels of yeah. serine diet, but that's a different case. Uh. Um, so, so you introduced um, serine, glycine, and threonine um, as in um, as sort of in in one pathway, in yeah. one metabolic pathway, and dependent on each other. And then your analysis set the uh, threonine apart, but you said that glycine is probably still uh, involved in the um, yeah. pathogenesis somehow, uh, somehow via serine. Yeah. How is it possible that threonine, which is part of the three, uh -huh. close to them in the met metabolic pathway, can can be ruled out? Because theoretically, yeah, yeah. it should affect the others. Um, our collaborator actually helped us to understand this. Very good question. Our collaborator helped us out to understand um, how this might work. Basically, the hypothesis is that we have, as human, we have lost the ability to translate threonine into glycine, when he said apparently the other way around should be true, for as much as we know. So a depletion, if, if you have a depletion of serine, what will happen is that all of your available glycine gets turned into serine. When it's that threonine itself, a low threonine doesn't help you. So that, that's why we could tear it apart and basically said, also because the genetics that is behind threonine is, com is quite different from the genetics that is behind both glycine and serine. Also, since the two metabolites are so correlated in the metabolism, completely separating the genetic signals that affects both of them is quite difficult. When it's that threonine, at it least, is still quite correlated, but it's not as much correlated as the two of them are. So that's possibly how. Andres. Hey, you said that the deoxysphingolipids are very toxic, especially for neurons. Yeah. Um, do you see any higher incidence in MACTIL patients of neurodegenerative diseases? Diseases. So, 
It's a very good question. We, so nothing has been observed in the first study that I've shown you when I was presenting the general epidemiology about MACTEL. Um, no other comorbidities apart from type 2 diabetes were observed, apart from high BMI, hypertension, or something like that. So that's actually like a very new thing. What we want to check now is that MACTEL patients that develop high deoxy then are actually developing a peripheral neuropathy and other kind of neuropathies. Is that, yeah, we haven't checked yet, but it's definitely something that, yeah, like the consortium wants to check. Um, yep, it's going to be thrown. Great presentation. Um, Thank you. Age-related macular de degeneration, yes. really common in the community, um, on the rise with the ageing community, uh, and also associated with diabetes, I think, from, yeah. from memory. So have you seen it? Is, is there genetic data from that or mechanistic data that might your work might inform? I have. What is it? If I can get it. Ah, uh, no, this is diabetes. Okay. One well, thing that we try to do is that we try to compare how much the genetics was influencing both. Like, so from other studies, we know that the genetics can explain, can predict with 80% accuracy, actually using a lot of SNPs AMD. But similar results can be obtained with only five SNPs in MACTEL. So what we expect is that there is much more genetic going on in AMD. One of the very cool things that we can do is that we have metabolomic data that has been given us from one of our collaborators on three different kinds of AMD, and we check all of the metabolites that are important for AMD and all the metabolites that are important for MACTEL. The two of them don't correlate precisely, but what we observe is that there are especially some lipids correlations. So we see the glycerophospholipids are very, very high in, in both of them. Um, glycine, and I think his glycine in particular, should be high in, a, in um, no, low in both of them. And yes, there are other ones that instead have different direction, but what we can think about to do now is to basically go back on both, because we have the genetic information for both of them, from other available studies, we can basically check whether both the genetic correlates and where they correlate and compare them to where also the metabolomics correlate. And also um, bring it back to diabetes, which in fact, this brings me actually to this one, we saw some similarities between type 2 diabetes and MACTEN in terms of metabolomics. So both of disease present depleted levels of glycine, ether, lipids, and glutamine, and increased level of fatty acids, diglycerol, and phosphatidylethanolamines. So there is definitely a lot of correlation going on that we can start, try to not only investigate using metabolomics data, but try to maybe tear apart using the genetics as we did to actually establish a causative mechanism. Um, here we go. Pete? Uh, last question, by the Thanks, way. Thanks, Robbie. Um, what genetic background are the MACTEL patients that you've studied, and do you think the, what you've learned from the metabolomics data you can apply then to macular diseases in, that are more common in uh, ethnicities that might not be as well studied for genetics, like it's, GY studies, which tend to be white European background? It's a very, very good question. Short answer, we don't know. So the, um, all of our study has been done on Caucasian. There are other studies that have been published before in which they, they actually showed that the uh, GY signal and the genetic signal are related to, to a disease might sometimes be completely different from other, for other um, ethnicities. What we think, though, is that as we move towards the disease rather than from the genetic, maybe like we're moving away from the basic genetic, so maybe by tackling something that is closer to the disease rather than the basic genetic, maybe we could try to help on that way. But the short answer is that we don't know yet. We are entering in collaboration with, I think, like a, um, a new study done in China they should give us um, some Chinese uh, background um, MACTEL patients, but we still need to investigate. It's a very good question and something that, yeah, like we have to check because we don't know whether this is going to work. All right, we've got to finish up there. Let's thank Robbie for a very interesting Thank you so much, everyone, again. Thank you.